Hi YouTube family, welcome to Concept in Medicine, but are you ready for another concept? If so, kindly subscribe to my channel. Let's begin. We are going to be having a look at perennial tears today, but before we delve into the perennial tears, let's have a look at the perineum. So the question goes, what is the perineum? So when we say the perineum, it simply refers to an anatomical area between the opening of the vagina and the anus. So that region that you find between the opening of the vagina and the anus, we call it the perineum. So in short, this region here is what we call the perineum because it's lying between the opening of the vagina and the anus. So this is what we call the perineum. Now let's move on and look at the soft tissue structures of the perineum. So there are about five groups of soft tissue structures. We are going to take them one by one. The first one that we are going to look at is the muscles of the anus. The muscles of the anus. For the muscles of the anus, the first one we want to talk about is the corrugator cutis any, meaning that it has to do with the skin. And another name for that muzzle is what you call the Ellis muzzle. Ellis muzzle. What does this muzzle do? When this muzzle, that's the corrugator cutis any, or the Ellis muzzle contracts, it forms ridges within the anus. So when if you look at the anus, it has this kind of ridge structure. And this is able to form as a result of the contraction of the Ellis muscle or what we call the corrugator cutis any. The next muscle that we want to look at with regards to the muscles of the anus is the internal anal sphincter, which you, we should know that it is an involuntary muscle which helps in defecation together with the next one which is the external anal sphincter. For the external anal sphincter, it is a voluntary muscle. So if we take the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter together, they contribute to defecation and the maintenance of fecal continence. The next group of muscles that we want to look at is the media muscles of the urogenital region. And this consists of the superficial transverse perineal muscle, the deep transverse perineal muscle, and finally, the bulbo cavernosus, also known as the bulbo spongiosus. Now, with the bulbo spongiosus or the cavernosus, they have a special function. What do they do? The bulbo cavernosus forms the vestigial bulb in females and forms the penile shaft in males. Formerly, the bulbo cavernosus is referred to as the bulbo spongiosus. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, let's move ahead and look at the media muscles of the levator ani. With the media muscles, with the media muscles of the levator ani, you should just remember they start with P. But first of all, let's talk about the composition of the levator ani muscle. The levator ani muscle is consists of three muscles. What are they? We have the pubo rectalis pubococcygeus and the iliococcygeus and out of these three the ones that start with p they are located at the media aspect therefore the medial muscles of the levator ani will comprise of the pubo rectalis and the pubo coccygeus the next group is the fascia of the perineum that covers the above muscles, the fascia of the perineum covering the above muscles. And lastly, the overlying skin and the subcutaneous tissues. So these are the soft tissue structures of the perineum. The next thing we'll look at is the perineal tears. Now let's have a look at the perineal tears. So the question goes, what is a perineal tear? When we say perineal tear, simply put, it refers to the laceration of the skin and other soft tissues which in women separates the vagina from the anus. 
Now let's have a look at this. We said the perineum is that anatomical area between the opening of the vagina and the anus. This is the vagina, as you can see. The labia minora converges posteriorly at a site we call the frenulum. The frenulum of the, the labia minora, or another name for it, is the posterior commissure of the labia minora, or another name is what we call the full shirt. Full shirt. The full shirt. Or what you call the frenulum, or what you call the posterior commissure of the labia minora. This is the anus. And now look at it. This is where the fear is happening. This is where the laceration is. This region here is what you call the perineum. Now there is a fear, as you can see here. And if you have a fear, a laceration in the perineum, we call it perineal fear. Laceration of what? The skin and other soft tissue structures. Where are they? They are in a region which separates the vagina, the opening of the vagina from that of the anus. And you have it in women because women, they have the vagina. Okay? All right. Now, you should also know that the perineal fear is the most common obstetric injury. Please take note of that. The most common obstetric injury is a perineal fear. And in our previous video, we said that episiotomy is the most common obstetric operation. Okay. And you should take note that episiotomy is different from perineal tear. One thing you should know is that the perineal tear is not intentional. It is not intentional. But if we talk, we talk about episiotomy, it is intentional because it's a surgically planned incision. It is intentional. Now, let's move on and look at the risk factors of perineal tear. For the risk factors, we can use an acronym MAN-BP. MAN-BP. Why am I saying MAN-BP? Because when you are looking at hypertension, it's more common in men than in women. Okay, MAN-BP. And the B is to the power 2, the P is to the power 3. So the M, which is the, the first one, is a median or midline episiotomy. In our previous video, that is perineotomy or episiotomy, we made mention of that. So the first one is what? Midline or median episiotomy. The next one, an advanced maternal age. That is greater than 35 years. The next one is nulliparity because nulliparous, the muscles within the perineum are so stiff, they are unable to relax adequately to withstand the, the bearing of the weight of the incoming fetus, and hence they, are, they easily get on. The next one is the bridge presentation, bridge presentation, which is defined as a fetus in a longitudinal lie with the battles or feet presenting. Then the next one again is a big baby, big baby with an estimated fetal weight greater than four kilogram. Then the next one is precipitated labor. When we say precipitated labor, we are referring to what? The expulsion of what? The fetus within three hours of commencement of regular uterine contractions. That's what we call precipitate labor. And if it's happening before time, it's happening quickly, which is a rapid labor, then it can predispose to a perineal tear. The next one is persistent occipital posterior position, meaning that what? The occiput is inclined towards the sacrum. It means it's one of the fetal positions that we can talk about. When we talk about fetal positions, we are referring to the, the relationship of the, the leading parts of the most prominent part of the presenting part in relation to fixed points of the maternal pelvis. And in, in this regard, it means that we are looking at the vertex presentation, whose denominator is the occiput. And the occiput is lying closer to the sacrum. That becomes occipital posterior position. And if it's persistent, we expect it to change. But if it is persistent, then it's going to be distending the perineum, causing a tear, causing a tear. Then finally, the last one is previous history of perineal tears. One thing in obstetrics is that when it has happened before, then there's a, a likelihood of it happening again. So those are the risk factors of perineal tears. And I said you should remember man BP. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is the degrees of perineal tears. Degrees. The degrees of the perineal tears are going to be dependent on the depth to which the laceration has occurred. There are four degrees of perineal tear. Now let's have a look at that. The first degree is 
when you have the laceration limited to either the full shirt or the perineal skin or the vagina mucosa then that becomes the first degree of a perineal tear the next degree which is the second degree is equivalent to the first degree plus laceration of the perineal muscles and the fascia the third degree it means that in that case you are looking at the second degree plus involvement of the inner sphincter complex involvement of the inner sphincter meaning that the inner sphincter will become lacerated and the third degree is subdivided into three groups we have the 3a 3b 3c the 3a meaning there is a partial fear involving less than 50 percent thickness of the external inner sphincter the 3b you have a tear involving greater than 50 percent thickness of the external anal sphincter then the 3c the internal anal sphincter is torn that would qualify for the third degree it's divided into three groups 3a 3b 3c as we've described the fourth degree simply put the rectal mucosa is torn it means that you are going to have the third degree plus the rectal mucosa is torn i hope that makes sense to you but again let's zoom in on a special type of perineal tear and that is what we call the button hole tear for the button hole tear in that scenario the rectal mucosa is torn with an intact anal sphincter complex it means that the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincters are intact they are not torn they are not torn there's no laceration only in the rectal mucosa is torn let's look at the principles of treatment of perennial tears so for the principles of treatment of perennial tears we can remember ATA. that's the ata to the power three then r so the first thing from that principle is adequate lighting before you can see where the injury is which tissues are involved you will need adequate lightening the lightening should be very good then the next thing that should be done is tissue exposure the tissue should be exposed to know the extent of the injury then the next thing that should be done is anesthesia for examination definitely patient will be in pain therefore you want to numb the area before examining the patient then the next one is analgesics during the repair and post repair then the following one is antibiotics because once there's a tear, microorganisms can find their way in there you want to cover for infections then finally finally a repair of the perennial tear by close appositioning and suturing okay so that is how you repair a perennial tear or wound now let's look at the complications of perennial tear the complication of perennial tear we can also use an acronym fcd there are three f's then C, then D. We can think of the fecal incontinence because remember I told you the inner sphincters, that's the internal inner sphincter and the external inner sphincters, they are responsible for defecation and maintaining fecal continence. So imagine the tear has gone into these structures. Definitely fecal continence cannot be maintained. Therefore, you have what? Fecal incontinence. So the first complication, fecal incontinence, the next complication fecal agency because these muscles are damaged then the next one is fistula formation once there's a, a tear an injury then you would see in the future an abnormal communication between the two different epithelial surfaces lined by granulation tissues that's what we call fistula then the next complication is chronic perineal pain because there's a tear there if it does not heal well, then the patient will be complaining of pain for a very long period of time. And you should know, finally, if the healing is by fibrosis such that it narrows the vagina, then during sexual intercourse, this patient will be complaining of pain. So in that case, we are talking about dyspareunia. And the dyspareunia, there are two types. They have the superficial and the deep, okay? So these are the complications of perennial tears. The last thing I want us to talk about is how to prevent perennial tears, the prevention of perennial tears. The first prevention measure is timely episiotomy. And I'm saying that if we don't make that surgically planned incision on the perineum or 
the posterior wall of the vagina, then definitely the opening or the birth canal become narrow. And once the baby tries to descend through that narrowed birth canal, that will happen. There will be so much pressure on the perineum, meaning that there will be what? There will be stress and strain on the muscles where if it becomes unbearable, it will cause a tear. So a timely episiotomy definitely can prevent a perineal tear. Then the next one is perineal massage. This can be done at home through the course of pregnancy. The next one is warm compress, warm compress of the perineum because this would enhance adequate blood flow to the perineal tissues, the soft tissue structures there, where they will be able to what? Exercise their elastic strength. It means that they will be able to withstand the coming of what? The baby. Then finally, finally, perineal support during labor. I hope we've made a lot of sense from the concepts that we've learned today. Kindly subscribe, share, like, and comment which concept you would like to see in my next video. Bye-bye.